Well, we've been in uh, Matthew chapter 28 as we have uh, I do these daily devotions. And the last two, the first one was that Jesus said, all authority is given to me. This is just before he goes back to heaven, remember. And then he says, now I want you to go. And he gave a command. He said, I want you to go and make disciples as a result that I have all this authority. I want you to baptize them and I want you to teach them. And I want you to observe everything that I've commanded you. That's a lot of stuff. Now, I want you to know, when we look at this passage, we have to think of it as the church in general and not as an individual. If I think of this as just the individual, then it's my job to do, uh, to go. It's my job to make disciples, to baptize and to teach. Now, not everybody's going to be doing all these things. Everybody has a different task. But if we are all cooperating together, really, we all need to be going. And we all need to be looking for opportunities to do all of these things and to teach all these things. But we're going to be cooperating with one another. So part of that going is finding someone who's a prayer warrior, who's praying for the person that's preaching. I have prayer warriors that pray for me on a daily basis. And some of them are old. Uh, some of them are close to 100 years old, and they're praying for me on a regular basis. And I can tell you that I can't speak with power without people praying. The Apostle Paul pleaded for people to pray for him so that he could make the gospel plain. So I want you to, to grasp this, that... Everybody has a task in this. It doesn't mean that you have to be the orator, the great orator, or the, the, the pastor in the pulpit in order to fulfill this commission. But you have to be willing to share in your sphere, in your circle, and to reach out to people and to pray for uh, the work of God all over the world and pray for preachers and pray for that work and look for ways and opportunities I think we often limit ourselves with what we can do because we don't look at the ability of God. It's God's ability that we must rely on. I have found in my own life, uh, if I just waited and waited and waited, I would never get anything done. But I move forward and I trust that God is going to do something with these feeble hands. I trust that God will speak through these feeble lips. And he does. And friend, he can use you too. And it isn't the great words that you have to say. It isn't all of that. I can remember uh, someone who was felt convicted about their sin, and I knew it. I was a young Christian. I was only just a new believer. And a lot I didn't know. But uh, I wanted this person to be saved. And, and I was looking for some way to, 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 to bring her through. And it wasn't making sense to her it wasn't it wasn't quite grasping it and this particular day uh, uh we were talking and she said I, I don't know what to do and i said to her well all i can tell you is that god loves you and when after i left that conversation i felt so frustrated with my stupidity that that's all i said i didn't explain all the gospel though i had it previously at other times but it wasn't getting through and find out the next day she was saved. Why? Because that's exactly what she needed to hear at that time. It isn't the great words that we can come up with. It's the Spirit of God doing the work. And that's where I want to get to you, get with you on this passage here in this Great Commission. And it is the final part of it. When Jesus said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, and he said to go and make disciples and baptize and teach, he said this, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is what he had to say. I'm with you always to the end of the age. So what we see here in this passage is the command of God. It's, a, it's his authority to do it. It is what we are called to do. And then it is, but I'm with you always to the end of the age. I kind of look at it as like a sandwich. Here's the command of God. Here's the uh, what we need to do as the stuff in the middle. 
But then underneath the sandwich is I'm with you always. So we are sandwiched in with this command by the authority, but not just by the authority, but by the presence and the power of Jesus Christ. Wow, that just gives hope, doesn't it? That tells, gives us confidence. We are sandwiched in the middle of the authority and the presence and the power of Almighty God. So the task that he gives us to do doesn't seem that overwhelming when I consider who it is that's calling me. Remember, I was I said in yesterday's devotion that what does it matter what he calls us to do if he provides all that's needed for it? In this case, he has provided everything that is needed for what he calls us to do. It may be a simple little word. It may be prayer. It may be uh, a, a deed of kindness. All these things with a willing heart to do whatever the Spirit of God leads us to do in every given moment, we will discover the fullness of, the God, of God's ability to accomplish what needs to be done. Remember the disciples, they all fled. Uh, what were they going to do in the face of a world that was hostile to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ? And what are you going to do in the face of that hostility and indifference and all the other things that we, we think of and that the devil reminds of, us of when it comes to sharing the gospel with people? What, what, can we, what can we do in the face of all of that? What can we do in the face of people or family members that say you're nuts, you're crazy, I'm not interested? We lean on Jesus Christ. We trust him to do what cannot be done on our own. You know, there was this uh, command that Jesus gave in the gospel of, of uh, in the book of Acts, pardon me. And this was, of course, before he went to heaven as well. This is part of that great commission. And in Acts uh, chapter 1, we have this statement uh, from, from Jesus. And he uh, tells them what is to happen. He gives them a word of what's coming. And that's uh, very important for us to understand because here's what he says. He says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 7 he said to them as they were asking him oh lord are you going to restore the kingdom are you going to to uh well i'll read it for you they we had come they asked him saying lord will you at this time restore the kingdom to israel their focus was still even after the resurrection even after the appearances of jesus christ they were focusing on the nation of israel and a glorious kingdom Maybe they were still sitting about thinking about, you know, can I sit on a throne next to you, Jesus, and rule? But he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put under his authority. He says, this is an, that's none of your business right now. But here's your business, okay? Christian, here's your business. But in order to accomplish the business, here's how he says it. But you shall receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So here's what he says. They're thinking about establishing up a kingdom, and uh, a, an earthly kingdom, and getting it all set up, and, and hopefully probably being involved in the rulership of it. And he says, look, let's not talk about that right now. That's not your business right now. But what your business is about is to be my witnesses. That's what he says. He says, but you shall receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's the call that he gives to us. The same command that he gave in Matthew 28 that we've been looking at. But here's what he says. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So what he's telling the disciples is, I've got a task for you to do, but you can't do it 
You're powerless unless you have the power of God. But he didn't leave them powerless. He told them what he was going to do. But he actually said as well for them to stay in Jerusalem until in, Ma in Acts chapter 1 verse 4, he says, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So they had to wait for the Spirit's power or they couldn't do this task. It was already evident they couldn't do the task without something more than what they already had. They needed the Spirit's power. It was the Holy Spirit's power that gave them special uh, providence to be able to go out and do the miracles they were doing while they were with Jesus. But it was the power that came and went. But now, Jesus says, I am sending the Spirit of promise. He promised it in John 15, 16, and 17. He promised the Spirit coming. And he promised the spirit to be the spirit of truth that would reveal truth to you. He promised the spirit of truth would come to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment, but also to be the comforter and to be with us, to be in us. So now when we consider the call of God and we consider that sandwich, I said, uh, the authority of God, the command of God and the presence of God. Let's think about that presence for just a few moments. God himself is three persons, but one God. There's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Now, it may confuse you, but God is God. And yet the Bible clearly teaches each one is God, and yet one at the same time. Three persons, one God. Whether you like that or not, that doesn't make any difference to the truth. The truth is clearly expressed in Scripture in this way. As a matter of fact, it says baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, clearly right there, as Jesus gave the command to go. So the person of the Holy Spirit is God himself who is not just a piece of electricity or a force, not an it. He's not just the power of God. He is God and he is powerful. Just as Jesus is God is powerful, the Father is God and is powerful. So he says, you'll receive the Holy Spirit. He will re you'll receive power when you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit had not yet been given, it says in John chapter 7, because Jesus was not yet glorified. But now Jesus has been glorified. The Holy Spirit has been given to the church. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into you. The Bible says there is only one spiritual baptism in Ephesians chapter 4. And so he tells us, what's that one spiritual baptism? That is the Spirit of God that brings you into the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it actually tells us that we are all baptized by one Spirit into one body. So every Christian has the Holy Spirit. I believe every Christian receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit the moment that they are converted. We are immersed in the Spirit of the living God. He has come to dwell within us. Now, I also believe that we are called to be filled with the Spirit. That's something different. The filling of the Spirit, of course, should happen when we are converted with the baptism of the Spirit of God. But subsequently, we are to be continually filled with the Spirit of God. Continually. And the word filled here gives the picture of controlled by the Spirit. Because it's used in Ephesians and it says, don't be drunk with wine. We're in his excess, but rather be filled with the Spirit. Don't be controlled by wine. Don't let wine control all your faculties. Instead, let the Spirit of God control your faculties. So God has not left you an orphan here. God has not left you with a little. He's given you nothing less than himself. This is where the power comes from. It comes from him. It's not something separate that he throws at you and says, here's the power. He's not giving you a power pack to go and do the work. 
He's not giving you a, electricity or a force like the Star Wars thing. May the force be with you. He's not giving you that. He's giving you himself. He's giving you all that he is to live in you so that you can do all that he calls you to do. You'll receive power. Then you'll be my witnesses. Now, I don't want you to think of the Holy Spirit as um, something that God gives you for you to control. It's not the case. If you think about a, a glove and a hand, you put the glove on the hand, and that uh, glove then becomes part and parcel of the hand's work. Right? The hand does the work. The glove is united with it. So whatever the hand does, the glove does. Now, a lot of people think that the Holy Spirit is the glove that God gives us for us to do the work because we're the hand. But we've got it all backwards, friends. It's not like that. The Holy Spirit is the hand. We're the glove. You get the difference? That's a radical difference. Because now, it's the Holy Spirit that's in control. And whatever the Holy Spirit does, we do. And when you think of it in this, these terms, it causes us to realize Oh, God has come in here. When I trust Christ as my Savior, God himself comes to live in me, and I'm submitting to him. He has all the authority. Whatever he says for me to do, I say, yes, Lord, I'll be the glove. But you're the hand. And so whatever the hand does, the hand can do very well. Nobody's going to stop the Holy Spirit. And I'm along. I'm part and parcel of it. He uses me for the task. That's what you use gloves for. Gloves are used for the particular task you're doing. We're the glove, he's the hand. Do you see the difference there? Oh, and, and what relief it gives to us. Because if I yield to the Holy Spirit, I yield to his control in my life, then he is guiding, directing, and doing all that needs to be done in order not only to share the gospel, but to live the Christian life at all. It's the spirit of the living God doing this work in you and in me that enables it to be accomplished. Oh, what a command he gives. What authority he has. But what a presence there is with us in it. God himself. That is why it's so important to understand the fact that the Holy Spirit is God. It's not just a theological statement. It's reality in the trenches of life. If the Holy Spirit is only a force or electricity, then it's mindless. And you're the one that's doing the work with it. You're the one that's controlling. But if he's God himself, he's not mindless. He is the supreme authority. He understands, sees all things, knows all things. And he is that God of all comfort, the God of love. God is love. He is all authority, power, and ability. No lack with him. So then the, the task of living the Christian life suddenly becomes amazing. It suddenly becomes, oh, oh, I'm the glove, he's the hand. So it is no longer I living, but Christ living in me. The heart of who I am, the strength of what I can do, the wisdom for what comes next, all comes from the person of the Holy Spirit living in me. Yes, this task is daunting, as every task is. Indeed, the whole Christian life is absolutely daunting. It's impossible. Only possible by the Spirit of God doing it in you and through you as you yield to him. Now, God has given you and me, as a Christian, if you're a believer today, he's given you the privilege of surrendering and submitting to the Spirit's control that we might be used by him. We're not gloves that are set aside, but gloves that are constantly being used by the Holy Spirit for his glory. So, 
as you think of these uh, passages, I want you to, to understand the great privilege it is to be a Christian and that the task he's calling to you is not so impossible now. It's, it is possible because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I want you to know that, that one of the titles of the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. It's himself. So friends, uh, that's that little passage from Matthew's Gospel. And uh, it, it's just so amazing to look at and to consider what God is calling you to do. He is providing everything that's needed. But it's not just tools and, and abilities or even gifts. And yes, the Holy Spirit gives gifts to us so that we can accomplish the things we're called to do. But it's not just those things. It's himself. That's the most important thing of all, himself. Because without himself, <laughs> there's nothing. Without him, without the Spirit's power, there is no strength, there is no comfort. What a dry, dead Christianity we have if we are seeking to minister life without the Spirit's power. And the only way that the Spirit's power will be revealed in the life of a Christian is if he's filled with the Spirit. If you're yielded to the Spirit of God, if you're not, powerless. Lots of sermons can be preached, and they can all be theologically correct, but they can be absolutely powerless and fall to the ground with no ability to bring life to anyone, because it's without the Holy Spirit. We need Him. We need Him every hour, every second. But thank God He's been given given to the church. So, yield. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Be controlled by Him. May God give you grace in this as we will consider further some of these truths. And uh, it's just been great. For me, my heart is encouraged and blessed just thinking again. Oh, Lord, the task you've given me to do is beyond me, but not beyond you. And you're here. You're here in all your personhood to comfort to strengthen to cause me to be able to do what you called me to do without a doubt god bless you you know he has called us and he's called us to go freely with this wonderful message and and uh, thinking about this in terms of the spirit of god uh, inviting us to do this here's a little a little chorus that i'm going to sing and it's called freely freely God forgave my sin in Jesus name I've been born again in Jesus name and in Jesus name I come to you to share his love as he told me to he said freely freely you have received freely freely give go in my name and because you believe Others will know that I live. All power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven, in Jesus' name, and in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his power as he told me to he said freely freely you have received freely freely give go in my name and because you believe others will know that I live.
freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. By the Spirit's power, by Him, we can.